I would like to thank everyone for joining us for today's webinar about COVID-19 and the impact that it has on the IDD population. But before we get started, one quick housekeeping item. When you're submitting questions via the chat box today, please make sure to select all panelists. That'll ensure that the questions get to the right folks. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to today's moderator, Leslie DeGroat, who is the Clinical Coordinator for the Division of Developmental Disabilities. Leslie? Um, let me show my uh, video here, sorry. I'm getting a little excited. Um, good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. I'm Leslie DeGroat, as Heike said, and I'm honored to be able to introduce our speaker this morning. She will be presenting information on COVID-19 and how it affects people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And we'll be taking questions afterwards, so please put your questions in the chat. Now, I'd like to let you know some things about our esteemed speaker. Dr. Kristen Saul is a pediatrician with extensive experience in medical diagnosis, evaluation, and treatment of children with a concern of autism and other neurodevelopmental disorders. She is an expert in quality and process improvement for comprehensive autism diagnostic and longitudinal services. She is a professor of clinical child health at the University of Missouri, executive director of Echo Autism, and scientific advisor for the National Institutes of Neurologic Disorders and Stroke, and medical director for MU Missouri Telehealth Network in the MU Office of Continuing Medical Education. Dr. Saul is the president of the American Academy of Pediatrics, Missouri chapter. She is actively engaged in the AAP on a national level with subcommittees, councils, and sections. She completed medical school and pediatric residency at the University of Missouri. Dr. Saul is the site principal investigator for autism intervention research for physical health autism treatment network and serves in national leadership roles with each program. She is also founder of Echo Autism, an innovative framework to increase community cap capacity to care for children with autism and other developmental or behavioral concerns. Echo Autism is considered a national model for expanding autism diagnosis and treatment to underserved and rural populations. Her team has established partnerships with healthcare entities in more than 15 states and five countries. Dr. Saul has an extensive research profile in autism, telehealth, telementoring, rural health care delivery, health disparities and inequalities, and family-centered care. Not only all of this, but Dr. Saul also has numerous publications in the aforementioned areas. So I'm honored to turn it over to you, Dr. Saul, and um, I would like to remind the audience to just don't forget to put your questions in the chat, and we will answer them after Dr. Saul's presentation. Dr. Saul. Yes, thank you, Leslie, for that wonderful introduction. I appreciate it. It's always a little bit, um, you know, I, I'm a normal human being. I'm a mom, I'm a pediatrician, and I'm from Missouri, and I love what I do. So thank you for that really warm welcome. I am delighted to be here today um, and to talk about something that's near and dear to my heart, which is people with disabilities, but also um, how do we stay healthy and well? And so we're going to talk. I'll share my slides here in just a second. But I want to make sure everybody kind of has a good understanding of what I'm going to cover today. You know, I think that there's a lot of opportunity for us to continue to to grow in our basic understanding of what COVID-19 is and then how do we keep ourselves healthy, but also how do we support our neighbors, our kids, our our communities in making decisions that make sense for us and that are based in um, evidence informed or evidence, uh, you know, evidence based information. So. I think today I'm really most interested in being able to answer your questions. So my talk itself is going to be somewhat brief, um, but I th certainly think it's always important for us to anchor ourselves in the basics of what we're talking about. I don't know about you, but I feel like uh, an entire new lingo has been created in the last 18 months. You know, nobody had ever heard of the word COVID um, up until, uh, you know, uh, March ish, uh, 20, maybe a little sooner if you watch a lot of international news. But certainly there's just been so much, so many things to take in and so many things for us to try to figure out and to manage. And so that's what I wanna to do today is kind of anchor ourselves in some of those important things and then have a lot of opportunity for conversation. So first I wanna thank um, all of you for obviously joining and being a part of this learning experience. And I think that's really important. It says to me that if you're here today, you're hoping to continue to grow in your understanding and your and your knowledge and hopefully your ability to support others 
uh, through this pandemic. This pandemic has definitely been tough and uh, we continue to see new and, you know, um, updated information on an absolutely daily basis. And so today we're going to, we're going to talk about that. I also want to thank um, not only the Missouri Telehealth Network, who really supports so much of the work that we do around dissemination uh, through the ECHO or Extension for Community Healthcare Programs or uh, Outcomes Program, and then also the Missouri AAP. Yes, I am the president of the Missouri AAP. And so that is a big deal in that we want to make sure that kids in the state of Missouri are healthy and well both mentally, physically, and academically. So we'll talk a little bit about that too. And then clinically, I am a um, professor of medicine at the university and I take care of and support many, many awesome people um, who uh, may have an autism diagnosis or other types of abilities. And so certainly glad to be here. So I'm gonna, I know I'm sharing my screen. Let me see if I can get it to move, perfect. So like I mentioned, we're going to understand the basics and then we are going to think about how do we as um, help, you know, individuals in our communities think about what it means, what uh, SARS-CoV-2, which is the official name for COVID, um, what it is exactly. We're going to understand the symptoms of COVID-19 and how to protect yourself and those around you. I will specifically touch on some of the issues related to de developmental disabilities, but certainly I think that'll be our biggest chance to have lots of questions and answers. So what I want to start with, and I think this is important. So I, in putting this talk together, decided I actually wanted to start off with a short video. So this is about a three minute video that helps us to think about what is a virus. For me as a physician and uh, an active member of my community, I think that really starting with the basic fundamentals of what exactly is, is it that we're talking about can be critical. And so as we're talking about how this pandemic affects people with disabilities, I think um, it's even more important for us to know how to use plain language and use normal everyday words um, to explain a virus. So this video is is uh, a good one. I wouldn't say it's the only one or the perfect one, but I think it's a good place for us to start our conversation today. So it's about three and a half minutes. And so I hope that I hope that this is useful to you. So I'm going to start us there and then we're going to continue to walk through um, the slides and the presentation. So give me one second. To make sure that it pulls up on the right side. All right. Oh, wrong, wrong button. I don't want to play it on my television. <laughs> then no one will be able to see it. Okay, here we go. On Earth. Viruses are easily the most abundant life form on Earth. If you accept the proposition of the dumb luck, try multiplying a billion, billion, then multiply that by 10 trillion. And that power is the mind boggling number of individual viral particles estimated to populate the planet. Viruses come in many shapes and sizes, although they're all small and infect everything, including plants and vegetables. None of them work in precisely the same way. The virus a living thing, maybe, sometimes, it depends on location. Outside of the cell, the viral particle is inert. Some, a virus can't reproduce itself, or, for that matter, produce anything at all. It's the ultimate parasite. Viruses travel light, taking only the baggage they absolutely need back into a cell, commandeer its molecular machinery, multiply, and make it escape. A virus's travel plan always includes its genome and a surrounding protein shell, or capsid, which keeps the viral genome safe, helps the virus latch onto cells and wiggle inside, and on occasion, affects its offspring's getaway. Some viruses also wear greasy overcoats, called envelopes. They're made from stolen shards of the outer membranes of the last cell they infected. Influenza, hepatitis C, herpes viruses, HIV, and coronaviruses all have envelopes. These greasy overcoats break down in soap, which is why you should wash your hands often. For a virus to spread, it must first find a way into a cell. Penetrating a cell's perimeter isn't easy. Yet viruses have ways of tricking cells into letting them in. Typically, a portion of the viral capsid will have a strong affinity to bind with one or another protein, spotting the surfaces of one or another particular cell type. Viruses use proteins sitting on the cell's surface as docking stations. 
The binding of the viral capsid with that cell surface protein serves as an ignition to keeping the virus's invasion of the cell. The viral genome, like ours, is an instruction kit for the production of protein the virus needs. This genome can be made up of either DNA, as is the case with virtually all other creatures, or its close chemical relative, RNA, which encodes genetic information just as DNA does. Most mammal and protein viruses' genomes are made of RNA. Another crucial protein or enzyme for viruses is known as a polymerase. Inside the cell, polymerases generate numerous copies of the virus's gene, hijacking the cell's molecular assembly to produce capsid subunits and other viral proteins. Capsid, a virus's protein shell, self assemble from their subunit. Freshly made copies of the viral genome are packaged inside new made capsids for export. Sometimes the escape is violent and involves the new viruses coming through the outer membrane of the host cell process known as lysis. Enveloped viruses can escape by an alternative method called budding, whereby they wrap themselves in adhesive membranes from the infected cell and cloaked in these newly acquired greasy overcoats, slip through the cell's outer membrane. Even then, the cell having birthed myriad baby viruses is often left fatally weakened. And so, I, again, I hope that that is somewhat helpful. I'd show you the video for a few different reasons. And one of those reasons is actually to demonstrate how much, um, frankly, detail and level of complexity there is in understanding a virus, but at the same time to remind us that that's why we have science and we have so many of the things that are happening around us. Um, right now. And so certainly when we think through all of this information that's coming out, all those words, and and I will, you know, uh, admittedly suggest that that video is great, but I don't know that it meets the plain language mark that I would be hoping for. But I think the, less, the rest of these slides that we talk through today um, will help us to understand some of that complexity. Because one of the things that I know is that when I watch the news every day, and I like to watch a lot of different types of news channels to better understand like what people are hearing and and or how people are getting um, you know their information. There's just a lot of stuff that's coming our way, and kind of like that video where it's polymerases and this and that and all these things that people are like, what in the world? Can somebody just speak English, right? I think it's important for us to remember that when we're talking about a pandemic. We're talking about, especially with a novel virus like the coronavirus, we're talking about something no one has ever seen before. And that makes everything even more confusing. So I like the video. Um, there are others out there that are made for children. And I chose not to show that one because I knew our audience today was gonna be mostly grownups, at least they're, at least as far as I know, but hello, if there are children here um, and uh, welcome, of course. And so certainly uh, I hope that was at least a little bit helpful. So giving a little bit more context to the coronavirus, there have been many coronaviruses before. The, the coronavirus itself is not brand new. These are things we have seen. Other examples include things you've probably never heard of, but then some things you may have heard of. And what we know is that the SARS-CoV or COVID or coronavirus 2 showed up in China in, in uh, late 2019. And you know, there's been a lot of coverage as to who, where did it come from, all of that kind of stuff. And that's really not terribly relevant to the topic that we're talking about today. But nevertheless, we know that this, this booger, as I like to call it, so this virus showed up about uh, late 2019, and we think that it first showed up um, in Wuhan, China. And so as that virus um, kind of made its way around the world, going from you know, people in, in China who then maybe traveled someplace and then it got out, uh, we started to see more and more people being affected. And that's what triggered the definition of a pandemic, which means people all around the world started to be affected by the COVID-19 virus and getting very, very sick. And scientists started to recognize this is something we've never seen before. What is going on? One thing that I think it's important to understand as we talk about the coronavirus is not just like what is a virus or what, you know, all this stuff, because I don't, no one expects anyone to be a virologist or a scientist or any of those things, but there are a few important things to understand. The coronavirus, when you look at it compared to other 
kinds of virus viruses, it actually can be pretty infectious. So a lot of times people like to think about this in the context of the flu virus. Well, when we look at this little image here, you can see that one person who has the flu, so the flu is known as um, H1N1, or that's a type of flu, one infected person with the flu tends to infect another one and a half people, okay? So that's what this R not or fancy phrase for essentially um, a virus's ability to infect someone else. You look at Ebola, which many of us have heard about in our, you know, it's pretty scary stuff, um, that one person who's infected with Ebola can then infect another 1.6 or almost two people. Um, and you can see that there are other definitely more infectious viruses, but COVID up here in this top box still has a, quite a range of infection. And so when you have one person who's infected, two and a half or two and a quarter in this picture, um, people are likely to get infected because of that one infection. And actually this changes a little bit. You know, I'm sure most of you have thought about the uh, Delta or heard of the Delta virus, and it actually got an even higher, um, what we call again, an R naught or infection rates, so to speak, that's used very, very broadly. Um, but it says, gosh, guys, the Delta virus, the Delta version of this is actually even more um, infectious than the one, the, the version of COVID-19 that we saw last fall and even into the winter. And so as doctors, we are aware of like, oh boy, right? This means we're going to start to see a whole lot more people getting infected. Does that mean every person who's in contact with a, in contact with a person who has COVID going to get the virus? No. But it does tell us, okay, but here's what we can expect. Based on the number of people getting this infection, here's what we're going to start to see. And we're going to start to see our hospitals fill up. And then to be honest, that pattern has been very predictable, very, um, ex you know, it, we can see it uh, start to happen. And that's when things get really dicey and really difficult to think about how do we support people who need us to support them? whether that be a child, whether that be a person with a disability where they need additional significant supports, whatever that might look like. And so I'm hoping that by giving you maybe some information about the virus that maybe you haven't seen or heard before, that it might help to bring to light why people are so adamant about different kinds of mitigation or prevention strategies. And really that's what we're trying to think about now is how do we prevent the ongoing spread. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that um, in a few slides, but I think it bears repeating. So when we talk about comparing flu to COVID, it's really like apples and oranges. Um, you know, and it, it's certainly important for us to understand that yes, the flu can be super serious. Um, and yes, the flu can, you know, spread through a community pretty quickly, but it is much less infectious than COVID-19. And the flu has a shorter, what we call incubation time. So that kind of actually helps us in some ways. When you, when you have somebody who has the flu, we know that if, so for example, if my husband had got the flu tomorrow, the odds of me getting it within the next couple of days are pretty high, but I'm gonna know within a few days if I'm gonna get it or not. Unlike COVID, that incubation period where there's time to be infected or time to show symptoms is really, really long. And that makes it even more difficult to kind of keep yourself protected or make sure that people around you don't have COVID because that can be a big deal. And then hospitalization rates. So this again is fluctuating based on the variant. Right now our hospital race, hospitalization rate is actually a little bit higher. And so when we look at that, that means 2%, just two out of 100 um, people who get the flu get hospitalized, right? So tons of people get the flu and very few get hospitalized. But with COVID, you can see that that rate's quite a bit higher. So when people run around saying, oh, it's just like the flu, everybody's making this way bigger deal than it is, not so much, right? Like not so much. You can see that this is a big difference. And then also when we look at the number of people who are dying, from the flu versus COVID. Again, this number has fluctuated and right now we're at the higher end of this case fatality that we call it, because what we're seeing is that this Delta variant or the Delta version is much more infectious than the ones we've seen before. One of, uh, um, some of us are starting to call it the original, the origin, um, just to kind of play around with Marvel and some of the, you know, the superhero movies that we like to think of, partially because we're all so stressed that we come up with silly little coping strategies like saying, oh yeah, you know, the origin, um, uh, you know, the original um, or the OG 
seed, that original, uh, you know, original virus, if you will, actually was not as strong as what we see now. And people get confused because they're like, why is it stronger? I don't understand. Why is everybody talking about variants and versions and all of this stuff? Well, it's because viruses are smart. And so for those of you who did did find the little video clip useful, to me, one of the things that I like to share with people is that every chance we give a virus, not just COVID, but any virus to get us sick, gives it more chances to learn how to, how to basically beat our system. Um, doesn't mean they're trying to take us over. It doesn't mean they're alien invaders. Our bodies are smarter. However, the viruses are constantly learning. It's kind of like thinking about well, I mean, to borrow a little bit of, you know, biology uh, lingo, it's kind of like survival of the fittest. Now we are smart. We are humans. Our bodies are so, so intricate and incredible. And yet viruses are out there to try to say, hey, I'm a worthy opponent. And they're trying to learn how to beat our system, our human body. And so every time we give it a chance to learn and to then turn itself into something different, so a new variant or a new version of itself, that is even more issue that we have to then face as humans to be like, oh, dang it, now we've got to start, not over, but we have to start thinking about this in even broader strokes. And so I think what then that turns into on the media side is Nobody knows what they're talking about. Just last week, they said we, if we were vaccinated, we could take our masks off. You know, and now they're telling us we've got to put them all back on. Some of that frustration and that change in messaging is because we are learning new information every single day. But why are we learning new information every single day? Because this little virus is infecting more and more people and then therefore learning new ways to get us sick every single day. So we've got to figure out how to stop that. And so I hopefully thinking about this in this, um, you know, viruses have been around forever, like the video talked about, and there are gajillions of them. That's a, that's a term you should look up, gajillions um, of viruses that circulate around us every single day. And that's why our bodies are so awesome because they can learn and they can, they can adapt to those, to those um, foreign bodies, if you will. But sometimes we have to help it. Otherwise we get really, really sick. And then that's when people, experience death or serious, serious consequences. And so we'll talk a little bit about that. Another thing that I like to really emphasize, again, when thinking about just the basics, right, the basics, and I'm absolutely open to talking about well beyond the basics, but I think sometimes it's helpful to remember this. What COVID does, how COVID spreads is through our spit or through our saliva, okay? And so, again, our human body is very cool um, and it can do all kinds of interesting things. So when we're speaking, you know, we are actually expelling little tiny, tiny, tiny droplets from our saliva. Now, of course, some people, as I'm sure some of you have experienced, might spit more than others. Um, you maybe have someone with a disability who has more drooling than others. Well, that is where virus particles live. That is where the coronavirus or the SARS-CoV-2, the official name, that's where that virus lives. When we talk, a certain amount of those, you know, uh, ex um, viral particles are expected to come out of your mouth. When we yell, when we sing, when we shout, sneeze, all of those produce a higher force or velocity of virus coming out of our mouths, okay? And so that's why, you know, we cover our mouths so that we can make sure that it's not spewing more spit at a longer distance. And so some of us have heard, I'm sure, you know, the debate between is it six feet, is it three feet, is it 27 feet, like what exactly is going on here? Well, the bottom line is it kind of depends. It kind of depends on what you're doing. If you're singing and you're really propelling that voice of yours out, that's going to send more saliva droplets out. Um, that's a normal thing that we all do every day, all day long. And yet, if you happen to have coronavirus, that means you're spewing that virus all around you, depending on what you're doing. And so that's where close contacts come into play. So when you're thinking about them, well, why do I have to like, I wasn't even around that person. Well, the thing is that it is about risk. It is about, well, okay, we know that this virus is carried by droplets, okay? So we also know it can hang out in the air. So that's called aerosolized. So we know it can hang out in the air after 
you have sneezed or coughed or, or you know sang a song or whatever and we know it can hang in the air for a certain amount of time and that's also changing so the delta variant the delta variant has some different um characteristics or different behaviors than other um, prior versions but nevertheless those close contacts then if, if i am the person who has coronavirus all of those people that were in my proximity are at risk okay and varying levels of risk depending on how close they were and all of those things so that's where this notion of close contacts come from now i also want to address this too so when we think about uh, where we were, you know, at the very beginning of the pandemic, and maybe none of you did this, but I did this, I was ordering my groceries from the, you know, um, I would pick my groceries up at, at the curbside or, you know, all the different type of grocery pickup kinds of things. And then I would wash them all down with um, alcohol or, um, you know, hand sanitizer, not hand sanitizer, sanitizing wipes, because at the time, we didn't know we didn't know enough about how this spread and so we were very concerned that the virus was lingering on surfaces for up to three days in some cases i mean i went so far and i'm not teasing myself about this but i was making sure that i was protecting my family frankly because i wanted to be able to see my dad who is older and i didn't want to do anything that could potentially you know cause him to get sick so we were putting our mail in a bucket, you know, and not touch it. We had a whole rotation cycle of the mail coming in and then, you know, whatever. So, you know, now we know that it really doesn't spread as much on surfaces as we thought. It is all about close contacts and that respiratory droplet as well as kind of our air um, around us. And so that then helps to inform our new prevention strategies. They're not so new, but they continue to evolve as we learn more about this brand new virus and that's an, I can't emphasize that enough. I get it. It's annoying when you hear something new every day on the news about Fauci said this and then now he says that and then CDC said this and now CDC says that. It's super frustrating and I understand that completely and yet it's partially because we've never seen this before. Not as living soul on this planet unless they're over 100 has lived through a pandemic, a global pandemic. So everybody is trying to figure out what exactly are we dealing with? And the amount of information coming out is so extensive at every given, frankly, day. Um, and so in other words, yes, things have definitely evolved in the last 18 months since we've been at this, but we are getting so much better at understanding how this virus spreads, what we can do to protect ourselves, and how do we make sure we get through this to the other side? So hopefully that's somewhat helpful. So this is an example of this notion around a choir practice, right? So one person in this choir, and this is an a, a example, a, not, not a made up example, this is a real life example from the state of Washington, one person in that choir had COVID, okay? And then because of that one person, the whole rest of the choir was a close contact and all the little yellow boxes were people who got COVID from that one exposure. And then the, the white boxes are the ones who did it. So you can see that risk is high. Part of that is singing propels your voice, your saliva further. Um, and so that's an important thing too. I like to tease that I'm really loud um, and very boisterous. So I would love for somebody to measure just how far my spit travels because I bet you it's pretty far. Um, but again, thinking about that as in a practical sense, I feel like can be really helpful. And then when you start to think about the people in your world, that you support who maybe, you know, either are ha have a harder time understanding all of the science and all of the mumbo jumbo, you know, we certainly can bring it back down to when your spit leaves your mouth, um, that causes more people to have um, to be uh, a potential, uh, you know, be potentially infected. So that's stuff we can do. And so we can then use our deeper knowledge to support those around us who might need a more easy um, version of what we're talking about today. And so I hope that that's helpful. For me, knowledge is power, but I think accessible knowledge is power. So the more that we can help each other understand, ideally in as plain of a language as we possibly can, uh, the better we can all do. And I think that also helps us fight misinformation because misinformation right now is rampant. And I'm not here to admonish anyone and I'm not here to lay judgment on anyone. And yet at the same time, it is so critical to make sure that where you're getting your information is reputable sources. But 
more importantly, that you as, a, as an individual understand how to take in information and decide, is this the information I need to know or what else do I need to get so that we can make that, um, that you can make a decision both for yourself and others about what you're gonna do to protect yourself. I think that's a really important factor. So symptoms of COVID. This is sometimes a tricky one too, because COVID, again, I call it a booger for a reason because it's a booger. Like they, it is confusing and it looks like other things. And sometimes you don't even have any symptoms and you're like, how in the world do I have COVID? What the heck, right? And so certainly all of those things can contribute to the confusion of what's going on around us on a day-to-day -day basis. What we do know is that the symptoms that are on your screen right now, but in case you're just listening by audio, I'll kind of fill those out for you, that they can include fever and chills, cough, shortness of breath, difficulty breathing. It can also include GI side effects like vomiting and diarrhea. It can also include feeling really achy and blah, you know, kind of more of those traditional flu-like symptoms. But what we also know is that the loss of taste and smell is a very, specific feature of COVID. And so that's an important thing to know. Specific means if you have lost your sense of taste or smell, your odds of having COVID are very high. Just because you didn't lose your taste and smell doesn't mean you don't have COVID. It just means if you happen to have those symptoms, it is highly, highly likely that that's what's going on for you. But again, remember, I said that incubation period in COVID is also very long compared to your common cold or compared to even the flu. So you can develop symptoms way late, which is partially why we have those long quarantine timeframes to make sure that we're not contributing more people with COVID out into the community. So certainly I get it, difficult and confusing. And it's also sometimes hard to know, well, are these my allergies? Is this just a cold? I think it's just this, I think it's just that. And so that's where, again, leaning into your relationships with your healthcare professional, whether that's a doctor or a nurse practitioner, asking them for guidance around your symptoms and getting tested is really critical um, to where we're at at this point. So thinking about some of the information that's going around right now about cumulative child cases. So I know if you've looked at the news anytime in the last 24 to 48 hours, uh, you are seeing headlines that talk about cases in children. Here's a really important thing to understand, and I think the kids are highlighting this better than anything else. This Delta variant is completely, okay, maybe not completely, but it is very different than what we were dealing with last fall and even last winter. So when we went back to school last fall in August and many, many places went virtual, it was because of the need to protect the elderly and the need to protect those with immunocompromised. We didn't have a vaccine. We had no meaningful way to protect anybody except for social distancing and masking. So at the time, using the information that we all had, um, and when I say we all, I don't literally mean I work for the CDC, but I mean when the experts had, they made those decisions, they informed their decisions with the information that they had and chose in many ways to have kids stay at home virtually. Now, I know throughout Missouri, we have a plethora of, of uh, experiences that families have had, whether it's in-person, hybrid, fully in-person, fully hybrid. I mean, last year, and my patients, I take care of kids from all across the state of Missouri. And so I've, I've seen it all and I get it. I get it. And I know some communities have not, not even had a case of COVID, you know, in, in October of last year, like yet. Um, and so I get how frustrating that felt. And, and, um, also, though, the more populous counties, for example, Columbia, where I'm at, St. Louis, Kansas City, things like that, we're seeing tons of cases, not necessarily in kids, but all around. So they made the decisions that they felt made sense. Fast forward 12 months to where we are now. We have this new version called the, called the Delta variant. And remember, that is because more people have let the virus have an opportunity to get a new skill set. Okay, so when you think about this virus, what a variant means is that it's the virus itself, that little thing that was crawling across the screen during the video that I showed you, it has learned a new skill. Okay, and that allows it to do new things and cause more issues. Now we know that the Delta variant or Delta version is causing a heck of a lot more issues in kids. But we've also learned that it was quite devastating to have children isolated at home last year. And so we've now had to decide, what are we going to do? What are we going to do 
um, both in our group settings, whether that's a group home setting, whether that's a school setting, whether that's a community outing setting, we have to make a risk assessment and make a decision. And so that is a lot of what we have to think about as professionals in the field. And I think each of you, whether you're a parent, whether you're a caregiver, whether you're a leader in your organization, you're making tough decisions every day based off risk assessments and what you know in those moments and, and trying to predict what's going to happen with that. So here with kids, we have seen a very significant increase in the number of children affected by COVID um, in the last about six to eight weeks, all due to the Delta variant. It is true that kids are still not getting as sick as the adults, but they are now getting much sicker than they were before. So last fall, we saw very few kids really get the virus and the ones who did weren't super sick. Now we're seeing tons of kids get the virus and the ones who are getting it, there's a decent percentage of them that are getting very sick. So right now, as of about two days ago, um, the most recent number of children, so the percentage of children um, in making up total coronavirus cases is 26%. Last year at this time, it was like 1%. And so we're seeing just a crazy increase. And one of the things that's important to understand is that many children, especially those under the age of 12, aren't able to do anything really, um, except for some, you know, wearing the mask and social distancing from each other uh, to prevent themselves from getting sick. That's why the layers of protection that we as their community um, are responsible for doing are so, so critical and why it's such an important thing. We are seeing children die. We lost a child in this state in this during this week from a coronavirus. That is not okay. And as I shared with somebody um, this week, my outcome is not, you know, number of children who didn't die, right? Like death is not the outcome I'm avoiding. I wanna make sure these kids can stay in school, can continue to learn and continue to be kids. And so certainly we talk about deaths and it's like, oh, you know, not very many kids are dying, but that's not what we're going for, right? And so that's an important thing to understand too. So also important to understand. So looking at children who tested negative for coronavirus versus those who tested positive. So kids who are testing positive are more likely to have attended large, large events, okay? So parties, either large events or close, uh, you know, non-socially distanced events. So play dates, funerals, weddings, things like that. We were not seeing a lot of um, spread through the schools. And so for those of you who were in in-person school last year, this was data that was being actively collected to teach us what do we know and how can we get kids in school safely? What we learned is that the kids that are masked and the teachers that are masked and the schools that are doing all of those prevention strategies did actually quite well. And that is what we now know and why we as a, a community and as a body of you know, experts or, or pediatricians or what have you are definitely wanting kids in school because now we know that when the proper prevention strategies are in place, they work and they work well. Okay. So what works and how do we help to keep kids in the classroom? So this is a good study that came out um, looking at a school system in, in Wisconsin and those that were using masks and had established cohorts. So, you know, smaller groups of kids um, rather than, you know, 100 kids kind of all mixing up throughout the day, smaller groups of kids and also maintaining that socially distant space when they could um, and making sure that they had close attention to quarantine. So if you got exposed, you stayed at home definitely humongous impact. Um, and so certainly this is a big, big deal as we face this fall. Um, and Missouri is seeing significant increases in the child uh, infection rate and also other um, you know, adults as well. So those are important things to think about. These are things I guarantee you all of you have heard, so I'm not gonna belabor these points, but this slide in addition to vaccination represents our layers of protection that we can do for kids to keep them healthy and help and help them stay safe. When I say kids, by the way, I kind of, everybody's a child because I'm a pediatrician. And so I don't just mean children. I mean all of us, right? So these are things that we can do to say, all right, enough already virus. You don't get to learn our system any better than you already did. Like you're done, you're done, right? Like no more. We don't want you learning our, our bodies anymore, get out. Um, and so this is an important thing for us to understand. Every chance we give it to get us sick is another chance for it to learn how to be smarter. And I'm really like, frankly, very tired of this little bugger and I would like it to go away. I bet all of you are too, right? Like this is no fun for anybody. 
And it's really important that we start to think about this as kind of a battle, if you will. And we have tools in our battle armor to get this out of our way. And yet we have to work together to get that done. So this is one of my favorite images. And one of the things I hope that you'll take away from this image, and we're, we're just about done with my slides, so we'll have a good full 20 minutes for questions and answers. But this is what we call the Swiss cheese model. We use it a lot in healthcare to prevent errors. We use it a lot in lots of different ways to help us understand how do we make sure something bad doesn't happen over here. Normally, or I would say in most situations, it's not just one thing that keeps a bad thing from happening, right? So for example, driving a car, you know, we have now, our automobile systems have become so advanced that many people have in their brand new, you know, if you're in a newer model car, all sorts of solutions to keeping you from having an accident, right? And so there's seat belts, there's, um, you know, uh, ABS brakes, there's all sorts of different things. There's blind spot detectors, there's, you know, all, all kinds of fancy stuff that are each layers of protection between you and a car accident. So this image that you're seeing right here is that same thing. You've got all those ugly coronaviruses over here on the left-hand side of your screen. And then you have yourself at the end trying to stay healthy, okay? Picture yourself, you could picture your loved one with a disability, you could picture your child, it doesn't matter. Whoever you're trying to keep from getting sick. And then each of these little Swiss cheese slices represents layers. But guess what happens? Sometimes the layers line up and that Swiss cheese bowl lets a virus come through. Really, the only way to keep us from getting sick is to layer it up, layer it up so that if it gets through the first three, it can't get through this, you know, the fourth. Um, oh, shoot, one did make it all the way to the fifth layer. Now what? Right? So it's all of these different things that, frankly, helps us to stay safe in the grand scheme of things. And it's true. I get it. People are frustrated. People are irritated. Why do I have to do this? I should I should get to decide myself. I don't want to do that layer. I only want to do these six layers, you know, or I only want to do this one layer and none of the other layers. I get that. But unfortunately, we are all part of the same world. And right now we're also all part of the same kind of army, if you want to think about it that way, trying to battle the army of little buggers out there called the coronavirus that are trying to slip their way through to get us sick. And so one of the things that's important to think about, and as we're thinking about this, both as grownups and as caretakers or caregivers or anybody um, in our community, these are real life things. This is not just, oh, she's spewing, you know, the, the standard mantra right now. Not really, this is real, right? And people are dying and people are dying quite a lot. Uh, we have lost a lot of Missourians in, um, uh, due to coronavirus and it's, it's devastating. Um, and so these are the things that we can do to pre protect ourselves and then protect our communities. So the last point I'm gonna say on my last slide is really about supporting each other. And when I think about supporting people with developmental disabilities, here's what I mean by this. So in my work, when I do autism and I'm you know, building systems to try to improve access and, and create more equitable services for people with differing abilities, it's about being kind. And sure, people throw that around all the time, but being kind is a verb. Being kind is an action. Being kind is about inclusion and being kind is not about just yourself. And so when we think about this, there are so many things that we can do to protect people who can't protect themselves. And really, when you think about it, there's all sorts of things that we do every day, especially if you're in the disability space. If you're a parent, you do so many kind things for your child and your family every single day. If you're in the healthcare field, if you're in the case management field, if you're in administration, you are always doing things that are about unprecedented kindness. This is no different. And so in our work as people who care deeply about individuals with different abilities, right? Not necessarily disabilities, but different abilities. We know that we can make a difference when we actually work together. And I get it, like, I, do, I get it. I'm tired of this stuff too. Um, and I, I get it. I wish I could just wake up and be like, whatever, I'm not gonna do any of these things, right? It's obnoxious, frankly, but it's the bottom line and it's where we're at. And there are things that we can do together. 
one of the things I wanted to make sure you know about is that we have um, an echo, which is a virtual learning collaborative. So if anyone can join, you can come and learn. So the COVID-19 and kids echo meets twice a month. It is for leaders in our communities. We have lots and lots and lots of people engaged in this, but it's also for anyone who considers themselves a leader, because frankly, all of us are leaders of at least ourselves, if not our families or our, you know, our spaces. So it's to come and to learn. It's not a place to shame each other. It's not a place to say, you know, that's you're an idiot for thinking that. It's a place to say, this is what I'm hearing. What do I do? This is what I don't understand. This is what doesn't make sense. Help me understand so that I, as an individual, can make my best informed decision. So it's really about coming together. And so there are multiple different kinds of echoes about all kinds of topics. We have multiple ones for autism, but this one is about COVID-19 and kids and how do we help support our community leaders, both in the school setting, the healthcare setting, and the public health setting, make evidence-informed decisions so that local decisions can have the you know the the information that they need those decision makers have the have the information they need to make solid and sound decisions so i know i've talked i've actually talked a little longer than i anticipated i hope it's been helpful and i'm going to stop with my formal comments here and then open it up for questions so i'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen and then we'll go from there together and i think leslie might be helping me with questions so i'm ready when you are ready Yes, I sure am. And thank you so much, Dr. Soul. That was awesome information and presented in such a relatable, understandable way. I appreciate it. Yeah, that, that was that was great. Thank you. And so far, there's not anything in the chat. So people, please just feel free to ask anything. Um, we're here to answer questions yep. and mm -hmm. I'm going to make. So while we're waiting for some questions to come in, I'll ask uh, I'll, I'll answer a couple of things that I hear pretty commonly. So one of them, um, and I'm going to make a couple of these very specific to people with developmental disabilities or disabilities. So um, it is true that our data, meaning the data we have worldwide, demonstrates that people with disabilities are at higher risk for getting COVID. I'm going to repeat that. People with developmental disabilities are at higher risk for getting COVID. There are lots of factors in play there. Some of it has to do with your own, you know, a person with disabilities maybe not having as easy access um, to testing or to care and treatment. Some of it has to do with group settings. Uh, some of it has to do with self-care. There's a lot of factors that go into that, but nevertheless, people with developmental disabilities are, period, at higher risk for getting infected and getting significantly sick. Um, so that's an important thing to understand. And what we are seeing is that it's not always related to another underlying health condition. So for example, people like to say, well, it was really their Down syndrome. And I'm like, well, I mean, it may have contributed, but at the same time, it's still COVID that landed them in the hospital, that landed them on a ventilator, that landed them to not be here. Um, and so it's important for us to understand that there is a higher risk. And so that's something I wanted to make sure people, um, people heard. And I see two questions. <laughs> I'll take the first one. I'm really, I do this all the time. So Leslie, we can just bounce back and forth. Does that sound okay? Yeah, that sounds fine. I apologize. I was not <laughs> seeing them. Let's fine. See. I see them. So oh, okay. Good. And then uh, okay. So okay, someone asked, um, is, the is there a recommendation yet for boosters for people with IDD? Great question. So here's the deal. And this, I will, I will readily acknowledge that this is a muddy point right now. I like to talk about muddy points because those are things that are like, wait, what? So here you have the um, White House ad uh, administration saying, we want you to get a booster. Okay. But then the FDA and the CDC have not officially, especially the FDA, have not officially blessed the booster yet. So there's a big kind of like, what um so here's the deal yes it is going to be recommended officially that everyone receive a booster after so about eight months after they got their last or completed their vaccine cycle and yes people with idd are in that same lot here's where we're at right this minute right now boosters are recommended for people who have underlying health conditions like cancer like an immune um you know, deficiency, things like that, like significant asthma. There's a list um, on the CDC. But yes, it's true. Um, here's going to be my bias, and I'm going to tell you this. Now, you can all go repeat me if you want to, but um, it's my personal thing. Oftentimes, people with IDD get left off that list. 
Okay, and so we know there are at a higher risk and yet they aren't always included when thinking about medical risk factors. So I would encourage all of us to make sure that we are strongly advocating for people with IDD to receive those boosters because they are at higher risk. So don't call the FDA on me, but I'm, and I know I've got 113 people listening to me and I'm completely okay with that. But the bottom line is you are at higher risk and it is important to protect them just like everybody else. Okay, thank you. Now I do have some questions on here. Um, one question is, um, do, how do you keep yourself safe as well as your immunity? Wait, hang on just a second. A question I have is how do you keep yourself safe as well as keep your immunity built up being always masked and staying in? Great question. Um, so the, the bottom line is that our bodies, so I'm assuming most people aren't spending in, uh, 24 hours in a mask. Like I'm assuming there's gonna be a good, at least six to seven hours of time that you're on. I'm saying that because it's a joke because that's all I sleep. And so I'm assuming you're not sleeping in a mask most of the time. Viruses and bacteria are around us everywhere. We just don't see them. And we also don't usually get sick because our bodies are fighting them. That's what's so cool about how our bodies work. However, remember, coronavirus is brand spanking new. Our bodies have never seen it before. So the masks are to protect us from that. The masks are to say like, ah, uh -uh. like I need my vaccine to work and I need to protect the people who can't get a vaccine. So that's why I've got this mask on. Now we are seeing actually some positive effects from the masks too, where we saw almost no flu cases last year, because guess why? We were all stuck away from each other and had masks on. So that was kind of an interesting thing. Um, I'm not an advocate for masking for the rest of our lives to keep us from getting the flu. That's not my point. My point is right now our bodies as a as a population, there's not enough of us whose bodies understand our bodies recognize the coronavirus to fight it like they fight the common cold or like they fight the whatever. So then everybody gets sick. Everybody has to stay home. It's just a hot mess. And so we've got to tone down the hot mess so that we can get back to, you know, a normal flu season. I do think that that's what we'll have eventually is coronavirus is going to become what we call endemic. It's just going to be part of our lives and we will have eventually learned enough, meaning our bodies have physically learned enough. Enough of us will have taught it through the vaccine or through natural immunity to like have it be a normal thing, right? Like I do, that's gonna happen, but right now it's not there. Um, and so that's why so many people are sick and dying. Okay, thank you for the question. Um, another question, are annual flu shots recommended this year as well as boosters if available? So great question. Yes, please, please, please get your flu shot because here's what I know, the flu is coming. Um, and because we are not as restricted as we were last winter, Last winter, we had really strict, not strict, but most people were doing a lot of social distancing. Most people were, you know, wearing their masks all the time. Oh, again, most, not all, and I get it. There are pop, like, I get that, that there, there's differences there. However, this year we're back. And so that means flu is gonna be back. And flu plus COVID is not pretty. Um, both from a personal perspective, like if you get the flu and COVID at the same time, you're gonna be hecka sick. Um, and so that's going to be an important thing to understand. And so, yes, please, please, please get your flu shot. Um, definitely important and nothing changed related to getting your, your regular vaccines that you would ordinarily get. Great, uh, a great question. Um, yeah. Here's another one. Um, is there a good source of information regarding the booster? We have been sharing information with individuals and families. Yeah, so honestly, um, the CDC is still the best source for information about what exactly you're supposed to do. Here's the point. I'm gonna let you in on my strategy. So I Google um, booster recommendations, COVID-19 booster recommendations. And usually the first thing that will pop up is the CDC. Sometimes it's occasionally a few other things. Remember, part of our mission or my mission, frankly, it's, it's, a, it's very much a personal mission, but it's also part of our COVID-19 and kids mission is to help te teach and guide people to make evidence informed decisions, right? So what I just described to you is my quick and dirty way of getting to information, and then I know how to decipher it. So I'm like, eh, 
don't think that's a very reputable source. Moving on, right? Like, and then I'll get to the next one and be like, yeah, all right. You know, and then usually what I'll do, and this is not taking hours, you know, but usually what I'll do is um, what I call triangulate or fact check, right? So then I'll be like, okay, now hold on. Yes, I like that, but let me fact check another reputable source and make sure they match up. Now, the good news is the CDC still is the authority. I get it. There's been a lot of um, difficulties because a lot has fluctuated and it's damaged the kind of trust in the CDC. Nobody, I think, is denying that. Um, and yet the bottom line is they are the experts and they really do know their stuff. And so if I wanted to know or when you want to know more about the booster, that's your go to place. So, again, yes, I did just tell you I Google, but Google is pretty great, actually. And it's a quick and easy way to find yourself some really good evidence based information to make your decision. Oh, well, so many great questions. This yeah, is I know. Powerful. I love it. Thank you guys so much for yeah. awesome questions. Yes, yes. Um, what are reinfection chances for immunized individuals who also have had COVID? Yeah, so this one is a, is tricky. It's also changing because um, ch meaning it's we're getting more information again daily. So here's what we know, and I'm I'm trying to remember what the most recent um, statistic is. So forgive me because this may not be perfect. Um, I think we're right around. I think around 5%, I'd have to look it up, of what we call breakthrough cases. But I, I believe in the last week, I've heard it being as high as 20%. Okay, so what does that mean? Delta is different than what we had last fall. So I'm going to give you a personal example. So my son got COVID last August, okay, symptomatic and sick. Fortunately, he just has moderate asthma. He doesn't have anything else, but it was very scary, you know. It's very scary. And so he got sick last August. He got vaccinated, right? Because I'm a pediatrician, like lickety split the second it was approved for his age range. Um, and he's fully vaccinated. Well, guess what? Uh, let's see, August 15th, he got it again. Symptomatic, sick, scary, not fun. Why? And yeah, I mean, I was upset, right? Like, I'm like, what is what? Like, I've done everything. He's done everything. What in the world? And so I get it. Like, when you hear those stories, and you're probably even listening to me, like, well, what the heck? She just told us all these these things we're supposed to do, and her own kid got it twice, and she's he's fully vaccinated. Like, I get it. It doesn't always make sense. But I tell you what, that day when I found out that he and he's old, he's a college student, by the way. That day when I found out he tested positive, I felt so crushed because I was like, why? Why? It's because we have a new variant because the stupid booger figured out a new way to get us sicker. And like people aren't doing the things that they know they can do to help keep our kids safe. And so, yeah, it was a tough day. Like I was pretty upset um, because it's hard, you know, and, and I get it, but I hope that that's at least helpful. So we're looking right now, I would say, I, I really do. I have to be super honest. I don't know the exact percentage. I've heard everything from 5 to 20. There is a known number. I just don't know what it is off the top of my head. Thank you. Excellent question. I mean, here's another one that maybe kind of was answered. Um, are there studies comparing immunity from those who had COVID, those who have been vaccinated and those who have been sick and vaccinated? Great question. Um, okay, so that, all right, I'm gonna also full transparency, right? So my clinical expertise is in developmental disabilities. And so I'm not a pediatric infectious disease doctor. So that kind of question is a, first of all, phenomenal question, because what you're getting at is essentially, does it make a difference? What is the difference and how do we know, right? Like, couldn't we just all get COVID and then take our chances? And is it the same as getting vaccinated? You know, I, I totally get your question and I love it. I also don't have your specific answer to that question, but I do believe there is a study that looks at that, but my my hesitancy in talking through it is that it's, it's a complicated study and I'm afraid I would give you misinformation. And so, um, great question. You're welcome to follow up with me and I can talk to the infectious disease experts and get that for you. So if that's something you're interested in, let me know. But that has, that study, I do believe, has been done. Great question. So many great questions. Now we're closing in. It's eleven twenty nine. Um, shall we? Um, 
I can copy these questions and maybe we can address it in a frequent, like in a question Q and A kind of a sheet later. Hike and I could do that if that sounds okay. Because since we have a uh, one minute, really until the end of the um, webinar. But uh, Dr. Saul, thank you so much. And if you have any closing comments, but this has been amazing. And and and, and audience, your questions have been amazing. And we're gonna we're gonna copy the rest of them that we didn't tend to because I'd like to I'd yeah. like to be able to address them because these are. Yeah. Yeah. And I will tell you again, so for those of you who are really interested or are curious or you're like, I don't believe any of this stuff, come, come and join us in our, they're free, they're online, meaning they're virtual, you can pop in COVID-19 and kids, you can go to showmeecho.org and join any of them. Here's the thing, like those very questions that are still left over are questions we talk through all the time and we keep a repository of the answers so that way you can find them and you can get them and we you know all that stuff the bottom line is the way i see it is that we're a team like a human you know a human team trying to get to basically fight this thing right and so the better we can ask and challenge each other and think about these tough tough issues but then also be willing to accept some tough answers i think the better we're going to get but what i will say that's where that be kind comes from is it's it's and I don't mean roll over and just take everybody at face value. That's not what I mean when I say be kind. When I say be kind, it means figure out your facts, like get the facts, understand what the issues are, understand what is being, you know, what is going on and let your, allow yourself to make an evidence informed decision, right? And so to me, it's not about shaming people. It's not about being like, oh, you were such an idiot. You know, yes, I did use that word, but like, it's not about that. It's about us coming together and figuring out like, okay, well, how are we going to get over this? Because this is getting really old. Um, and so figuring that out, I think is super important. And we will welcome you to join. There are two main COVID echoes. One is about kids and, and decision making. So like leadership and like how you make decisions. And then the other is much more nuts and bolts COVID, um, you know, like COVID cases and all that kind of stuff. And so either one though, I think any of you would would enjoy. Um, so again, it's showmeecho.org, um, and I think that that would be a really um, great resource for all of you. But thank you for having me today. I really appreciate it. This is a, um, a population and a, and a group and an organization, Department of Mental Health, that is super near and dear to me, and I'm so thankful for all that you guys do. Um, I actually, I know I'm way over, but I'm going to say this anyway, because I meant to say it earlier. The best thing we can do for people with de developmental disabilities is model good behavior, right? So model how to wear a mask model how to you know keep ourselves protected what i can tell you is that my at least my patients and my friends um, who have disabilities are awesome um, at learning how to adapt and how to to um to take on a new pattern of you know expectations it's just that it gets harder for them when it's you know well, you wear a mask today, but you don't tomorrow, and then you wear it again tomorrow, and then not the next day, and you wear it here, but not there, you know, and that, that's what's tough. And of course, I'm speaking from the lens of autism at the moment, um, so that predictable pattern, but I think that goes for all of us. I think if we really think about it, that's probably what we're all frustrated with, is like, which is it? Would you make up your mind, you know? And so the better that we can do to be consistent, to be clear, to be thoughtful, um, I think the better that we'll all do. So um, thank you for having me again, and I'm happy to come back or happy to do what we need to do to make sure people have what they need. So thank you.